Welcome to the Shutter. This first classic is the story of the Chapman family, titled Ruby Creek, and is told as it was written by Ivan T. Sanderson, a well-known Bigfoot researcher who published the account in True Magazine in March of 1960. This is from his interview, taken 18 years after the event. Stories about the Sasquatch have been appearing in print from time to time since the 1860s, and I have clippings in my files from almost every year since the early 1920s. But the modern history of Sasquatch really dates from September 1941, when one of these creatures paid a visit, in broad daylight, to an Indian family named Chapman. While the Amer Indian stories have usually been dismissed as legend, or laughed off because Indians are not supposed to be reliable, the experience was accompanied by too much physical evidence to be ignored. The Chapman family consisted of George and Jenny Chapman and children numbering, at my visit, four. Mr. Chapman worked on the railroad and was living at the time in a small place called Ruby Creek, 30 miles up the Fraser River from Agassiz, British Columbia in Canada's great western province. It was about three in the afternoon on a sunny, cloudless day when Jenny Chapman's eldest son, then age nine, came running to the house saying that there was a cow coming down out of the woods at the foot of a nearby mountain. The other kids, a boy age seven and a little girl age of five, were still playing in a field behind the house bordering on the rail track. Mrs. Chapman went out to look since the boy seemed oddly disturbed and they saw what at first she thought was a very large bear moving about among the bushes bordering the field beyond the railway tracks. She called the two children who came running immediately. Then the creature moved onto the tracks and she saw to her horror that it was a gigantic man covered with hair, not fur. The hair seemed to be about four inches long all over and of a pale yellow brown color. To pin down this color, Mrs. Chapman pointed out to me a sheet of lightly varnished plywood in the room where we were sitting. This was of a brown ochre color. This creature had advanced directly toward the house, and Miss Chapman had, as she put it, much too much time to look at it, because she stood her ground outside while the eldest boy, on her instructions, got a blanket from the house and rounded up the other children. The kids were in a near panic, she told us, and it took two or three minutes to get the blanket, during which time the creature had reached the near corner of the field, only about a hundred feet away from her. Mrs. Chapman then spread the blanket and holding it aloft so that the kids could not see the creature or it them. She backed off quickly to the old field and down onto the river beach out of sight and then ran with the kids downstream to the village. I asked her a leading question about the blanket had her purpose in using it been to prevent the kids seeing the creature, in accord with an alleged Amer Indian belief that to do so brings bad luck and often death. Her reply was both prompt and surprising. She said that although she had heard white men tell of that belief, she had not heard it from her parents or any other of her people whose advice regarding the so-called Sasquatch had been simply not to go further than certain points up certain valleys, to run if she saw one, and not to struggle if one caught her, as it might squeeze her to death by mistake. No, she said, I used the blanket because I thought it was after one of the kids, and so might go into the house to look for them instead of following me. This seems to have been sound logic as the creature did go into the house and also rummaged through an old outhouse pretty thoroughly, hauling from it a 55 gallon barrel of salt fish, breaking this open and scattering its contents about outside. The irony of it is that all three of those children did die within three years, the two boys by drowning and the little girl on a sick bed. And just after I interviewed the Chapmans, they also were drowned in the Fraser River when a rowboat capsized. Mrs. Chapman told me that the creature was about seven and a half feet tall. She could estimate its height by the various fence and line posts standing about the field. It had a rather small head and very short, thick neck. In fact, really, no neck at all. A point that was emphasized by William Rowe and by all others who claimed to have seen one of these creatures. Its body was entirely human in shape, except that it was immensely thick through its chest and its arms were exceptionally long. She did not see the feet, which were in the grass. 
Its shoulders were very wide and it had no breasts, from which Mrs. Chapman assumed it was a male, though she also did not see any male genitalia due to the long hair covering its groin. She was most definite on one point. The naked parts of its face and its hands were much darker than its hair and appeared to be almost black. George Chapman returned home from his work on the railroad that day shortly before six in the evening and by a route that bypassed the village so that he saw no one to tell him what happened. When he reached his house, he immediately saw the woodshed door battered in and spotted enormous humanoid footprints all over the place. Greatly alarmed, for he, like all of his people, had heard since childhood about the big wild men of the mountains, though he did not hear the word Sasquatch till after this incident. He called out for his family and then dashed through the house. Then he spotted the foot tracks of his wife and kids going off toward the river. He followed these until he picked them up on the sand beside the river and saw them going off downstream without any giant ones following. Somewhat relieved, he was retracing his steps when he stumbled across the giant's foot tracks on the river bank farther upstream. These had come down out of the potato patch, which lay between the house and the river, had milled about by the river, and then gone back through the old field toward the foot of the mountains where they disappeared in the heavy growth. Returning to the house, relieved to know that the tracks of all four of his family had gone off downstream to the village, George Chapman went to examine the woodshed. In our interview, after 18 years, he still expressed voluble astonishment that any living thing, even a 7 foot 6 inch man with a barrel chest, could lift a 55 gallon tub of fish and break it open without using a tool. He confirmed the creature's height after finding a number of long brown hairs stuck in the slab wood lintel of the doorway above the level of his head. George Chapman then went off to the village to look for his family and found them in a state of calm collapse. He gathered them up and invited his father-in-law and two others to return with him for protection for his family when he was away at work. The foot tracks returned every night for a week, and on two occasions, the dogs that the Chapmans had taken with them set up the most awful racket at exactly two o'clock in the morning. The Sasquatch did not, however, molest them or apparently touch either the house or the woodshed but the whole business was too unnerving and the family finally moved out. They never went back. After a long chat about this and other matters, Mrs. Chapman suddenly told us something very significant just as we were leaving. She said it made an awful funny noise. I asked her if she could imitate the noise, but it was her husband who did so, saying that he had heard it at night twice during the week after the first incident. He then proceeded to utter the exact same strange gurgling whistle that the men in California who said they had heard a Bigfoot call had given us. This is a sound I cannot reproduce, but I can assure you that it is unlike anything I've ever heard given by a man or beast anywhere in the world. These were probably the last words on the Sasquatch that the Chapmans uttered, and I absolutely refuse to listen to anybody who might say they were lying. Admittedly, Honest men are such a rarity as possible to be non-existent, but I have met a few who could qualify, and I put the Chapmans near the head of that list. Ivan T. Sanderson, True Magazine, March 1960. There is a broad range of negative emotion in this story. Fear and terror, anxiety, heartache and anguish in losing all their children. There are people that believe we should not expose these beings, and if they didn't do things like this, I might agree, but they do, and who knows how much worse. This next classic is a narration from the writings of Ronald A. Beck, son of Fred Beck. It's written September 27, 1967, entitled, I Fought the Ape Men of Mount St. Helens, Washington. He recounts the events of the famous attack known simply as Ape Canyon. It is my intention in this book not only to tell you about the historic encounter I had with these mysterious creatures, but also to reveal to the public what I believe they are. Truth often is stranger than fiction, but the strangeness comes from the clouds surrounding our minds, not from the mystery itself. First of all, 
I wish to give an account of the attack and tell of the famous incident of July 24th when the hairy apes attacked our cabin. We had been prospecting for six years in the Mount St. Helens and Lewis River area in southwest Washington. We had, from time to time, come across large tracks by creek beds and springs. In 1924, I and four other miners were working our gold claim, the Vander White. It was two miles east of Mount St. Helens, near a deep canyon now named Eight Canyon, which was so named after an account of the incident reached the newspapers. Hank, a great hunter and good woodsman, was always a little apprehensive after seeing the tracks. The tracks were large, and we knew that no known animal could have made them. The largest measured 19 inches long. It was the middle of July, and we had received a good assay on our claim, and everyone was excited. I remember I had a tooth that was aching, and I suggested to Hank that he should take me to town to see a dentist. But he was so enthused in the prospect of the gold mine, he barely took time to answer me. He replied that God or the devil could not get him away from there. We had all come up in his Ford, and I had no way to get to town unless he took me. So when we went back to our cabin on the north side of the canyon, I had a nagging toothache and little appetite for our evening meal of beans and hotcakes. Hank, though apprehensive, was still determined. We had been hearing noises in the evening for about a week. We heard a shrill, peculiar whistling each evening. We would hear it coming from one ridge and then hear an answering whistle from another ridge. We also heard a sound which I could best describe as a booming, thumping sound, just like something hitting itself on the chest. Hank asked me to accompany him to the spring, about a hundred yards from our cabin, to get some water and suggested we take our rifles to be on the safe side. We walked to the spring and then Hank yelled and raised his rifle. At that instant, I saw it. It was a hairy creature. He was about a hundred yards away, on the other side of the little canyon standing by a pine tree. It dodged behind the tree and poked his head out from behind the other side. At the same time, Hank shot. I could see the bark fly out from the tree from each of his three shots. Someone may say that that's quite a distance to see the bark fly, but I saw it. The creature I judged to have been about seven feet tall with blackish brown hair. It disappeared from our view for a short time, but then we saw it, running fast and upright about 200 yards down the little canyon. I shot three times before it disappeared from view. We took the water back to the cabin and explained the affair to the rest of the party, and we all agreed, including Hank, to go home the next morning as it would be dark before we could get to the car. We agreed it would be unsound to be caught by darkness on the way out. Nightfall found us in our pine log cabin. We had built the cabin ourselves and had made it very sturdy. It stood for years afterwards and was visited by many sightseers until a few years ago when it was burned to the ground. The circumstances of the fire I do not recall. In the cabin we had a long bunk bed in which two could sleep feet to feet, the rest of us sleeping on pine boughs on the floor. At one end of the cabin we had a fireplace fashioned out of rocks. There were no windows, so darkness found us all in the cabin, more calm now, and my tooth was better. Somehow, the excitement seemed to work as a temporary cure. We were sitting around, puffing on pipes, and talking about the trip home the next day. Each of us settled down in his crude but welcomed bed, and soon fell asleep. About midnight, we were all awakened. Hank, who was sleeping on the floor, was yelling and kicking. But the noise that had awakened us was a tremendous thud against the cabin wall. Some of the chinking had been knocked loose from between the logs and had fell across Hank's chest. He had his rifle in his hand and was waving it back and forth as he kicked and yelled. Hank always slept with his gun nearby. It was a Remington automatic, my gun being a 30-30 Winchester, which I still have. I helped to get the chinking off him and he jumped to his feet. Then we heard a great commotion outside. It sounded like a great number of feet trampling and rattling over a pile of our unused shakes. We grabbed our guns. Hank squinted through the space left by the chinking. By actual account, we saw only three of the creatures together at one time, but it sounded like there were many more. This was the start of the famous attack, of which so much has been written in Washington and Oregon papers throughout the years. 
Most accounts tell of giant boulders being hurled against the cabin and say some even fell through the roof, but this is not quite the case. There were very few large rocks around in that area. It is true that many smaller ones were hurled at the cabin, but they did not break through the roof. They hit with a bang and rolled off. Some did fall through the chimney of the fireplace. Some accounts state that I was hit in the head by a rock and knocked unconscious. This is not true. The only time we shot our guns that night was when the creatures were attacking our cabin. When they would quiet down for a few minutes, we would quit shooting. I told the rest of the party that maybe if they saw that we were only shooting when they attacked, they might realize we were only defending ourselves. We could have had clear shots at them through the opening left by the chinking had we chosen to shoot. We did shoot, however, when they climbed up on our roof. We'd shoot round after round through the roof. We had to brace the huge log door with a long pole taken from the bunk bed. The creatures were pushing against it and the whole door vibrated from the impact. We responded by firing many more rounds through the door. They pushed against the walls of the cabin as if trying to push the cabin over, but this was pretty much an impossibility. As previously stated, the cabin was a sturdy made building. Hank and I did most of the shooting. The rest of the party crowded to a far end of the cabin guns in their hands. One had a pistol, which is still in my family's possession. The others clutched their rifles. They seemed stunned and incredulous. The attack continued for the remainder of the night, with only short intervals in between. A most profound and frightening experience occurred when one of the creatures, being close to the cabin, reached an arm through the chinking space and seized one of the axe handles, a much written about incident and a true one. Before the thing could pull the axe out, I swiftly turned the head of the axe upright so that it caught on the logs. And at the same time, Hank shot, barely missing my hand. The creature let go and I pulled the handle back in and put the axe in a safe place. A humorous thing I well remember was Hank singing, If you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone and we'll all go home in the morning. He did not mean it to be humorous, for Hank was dead serious and sang under the impression that the mountain devils, as he called them, might understand and go away. The attack ended just before daylight. Just as soon as we were sure it was light enough to see, we came cautiously out of the cabin. It was not long before I saw one of the ape-like creatures standing about 80 yards away near the edge of Ape Canyon. I shot three times, and it toppled over the cliff down into the gorge some 400 feet below. Then Hank said we should get out of there as soon as possible and not bother to pack our supplies or equipment out. After all, he said, it's better to lose them than our lives. We were all only too glad to agree. We brought out only that which we could get in our pack sacks. We left about $200 in supplies, powder, and drilling equipment behind. I tried to persuade everyone not to relate the happenings to anyone and they agreed, but Hank soon let the cat out of the bag. We made our way to Spirit Lake, and Hank went into the ranger station. He had told the ranger earlier about the tracks, and the ranger had replied, let me know if you find out what they are. That was just what Hank did, to the puzzlement of the ranger. When we were back home in Kelso, Washington, he told some of his friends, and somehow the story leaked out to the newspapers, and the great hairy ape hunt of 1924 was on. Local reporters interviewed us. They came from Portland and Seattle, even a big game hunter from England came asking questions and had a large gun with them that must have been an elephant gun. Many people flocked to the Mount St. Helens area looking for the great hairy apes or mountain devils. I myself went back with two reporters and a detective from Portland, Oregon. We found large tracks and they photographed them. We did not see any of the ape men, nor could we find any of the ones we had shot. People were asking questions. Was it true, or was it just a wild tale? I can assure you it's true. Are they human, animal, or devils? I will answer that question in this book. That was a great ape hunt in 1924. In the last few years, more and more people have reported seeing them. There is an ape hunt being revived again, and another man has written a book on the subject and has formed a club whose purpose is to find evidence to prove that they already believe the abominable snowmen of America do exist. 
I sure hope you enjoyed these two Bigfoot classics. If you did, give them a like and a share. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. I'll see you back here next time for The Shutter.